Welcome to Truth Jihad Radio. I'm Kevin Barrett, bringing you great guests, talking about all the things that the corporate mainstream media leaves out, or badly distorts. And that pretty much goes for everything relating to the so-called war on terror, all of the big, spectacular public relations stunts that launched it and are keeping it going. The latest of these is the Charlie Hebdo affair in Paris. But now we hear that there's activity in Belgium as well. And here to talk about it is uh, one of my favorite regular guests, correspondent from the U.K., Tony Gosling, who puts out uh, all kinds of great stuff. He has a newsletter that's always very informative. And, uh, Tony, I guess uh, you're paying close attention, and you're just about as suspicious as I am about this whole Charlie Hebdo thing. Yeah, it might be worth just plugging the newsletter briefly, uh, Mm -hmm. Kevin, which is the PEPIS, I call it, the Power Elite Public Information Service, which I started in a kind of naive way back when I first discovered the Bilderbergers back in 1996. And so that I kind of chug that out whenever there's something going on. I try and make sure that there's, uh, you know, that that, that that information is circulated on, on the email list. But uh, I've also put together the Bilderberg.org website um, really w- when I was living in Oxford, going through some of the uh, uh, really sort of, I suppose, deep archives of the Bilderbergers in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which was quite an amazing experience, you know, getting stuff up from the stack, which is this tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books they keep underground in Oxford. And, uh, you know, it, it may be just getting transcribed up uh, a relevant chapter, which includes information about how the Bilderbergs all began back at uh, just at the end of the Second World War. And, of course, we're now suffering from this kind of underground mafia that was set up at the end of World War Two by the mainly by the US and, and the Brits, uh, but also by others. Uh, uh, as a sort of way of subverting democracy, and they've done very, very well with it. Uh, and I think these pa- uh, Paris Charlie Hebdo attacks lo- are looking to me more and more like just another example of how the securocrats, the security state and the banking sector, uh, plus uh, various other big corporations, obviously the oil companies, the arms firms uh, and royalty, and the media, the big, you know, in Britain we've got about five people that own pretty much all our media, including books, magazines, newspapers. They all get together at these Bilderberg conferences with Henry Kissinger sitting in the chair, you know, uh, pontificating, and the politicians come along and get the scraps from under the table. Uh, and that's really the, the the problem I think we're living with in U.S. and Europe is that we don't have any democracy left, really, uh, a little bit, but. Um, uh, these guys are really calling the shots. So you've got the banking system, you've got the military industrial complex, uh, and you've got uh, the uh, media all sitting in there basically saying what we're going to do. And this is it, the timing of the Charlie Hebdo, I think, is the pre, probably the giveaway on this, because we had back in October last year, we had the um, uh, attack in Canada, in Ottawa, uh, just as the Canadian Parliament was looking at whether or not they wanted to be part of this so-called consensus of NATO to go after ISIS and exactly the same in in Australia whether to uh, take part in this uh, uh, global coalition against ISIS and uh, isn't it amazing that ISIS just shows up to stage these big public relations stunts right at the moment that they can convince these governments to come and attack them yeah well I mean it's this is the uh, the problem with with uh, with all of this you know, your your show is called Truth Jihad, and of course the jihad is a holy war. You know, we've got uh, songs in the Christian tradition like Onward Christian Soldiers, you know, that kind of thing. But actually what's going on is that whole idea, it seems, has been hijacked. Uh, and the, the, the Brits uh, and the Americans, through Operation Cyclone back in the 80s in Afghanistan, really started the ball rolling by funding extremist Islamic groups. And then the Saudis got involved uh, with the Wahhabi tradition and others, you know, where they're training basically a whole bunch of young fanatics in some pseudo version uh, of Islam and uh, and winding up the entire world ever since, pretty much. Uh, and they created their own enemy, which, of course, this is the way the, the Bilderbergers, uh, people like that, love to operate. They want to control both sides of the chessboard, it goes, goes really goes back to in Britain anyway. Goes back to Frank Kitson and his uh, work with the British military in Kenya. Basically, gangs and counter gangs was the book, uh, and uh, what he did is basically set up uh, false versions of the uh, Kenyan resistance movement, uh, the Mau Mau they were called at the time by the Brits anyway, and that was the way they got called around the world. But they, they, so they set up their own opposition. 
and by doing that, uh, control the entire narrative uh, for the press. Mm -hmm. It seems like they've done that in Northern Ireland, too. They heavily infiltrated the IRA, and apparently the British infiltrators in the IRA tended to be bloodier butchers than the IRA people. Well, yes, and also there was the Dublin Monaghan bombings, which were the bloodiest of the whole campaign, which were, now it looks almost certain, um, the British Army involved in that, the Force Research Unit. Um, so, you know, yes, certainly right there. I think the IRA, uh, the, the kinds of attacks that they did, particularly towards the end of that campaign, like the Baltic Wharf bomb in London, uh, which I covered for the BBC, actually, funnily enough, um, years ago, and and the attack on the stock exchange were very much targeted against the establishment. I and mean, we don't really see that, of course, in France and in many of the subsequent attacks. The uh, attacks are random, pretty much, or on public transport, things like um, uh, the Red Brigade's attack in Bologna and the jihadi attacks since often seem to be kind of random attacks, which uh, are very, very different in nature. I mean, you would expect, if these attacks were real, for them to be on military bases or military personnel, Possibly political targets, highly you know charged political targets, but but no, you know, and that's a bit of a, a giveaway. I think this may not be exactly what it seems. You know, if if they uh, went after some some of the political targets that are not all that popular in the West itself, they might actually score some points. I remember when Paul Wolfowitz was in Baghdad back in maybe 2004 or something like that. And there was an artillery round shot into the hotel room right below his room. He wasn't injured. And they quoted some high-level American military source as saying, too bad they missed. <laughs> and, and, you know, you think if there were any real terrorists, they would be going after people like that, which would tend to actually slow down the war on Islam. But instead, everything that these, you know, spectacular terrorist attacks are accomplishing is basically just mobilizing the Western societies to go fight Islam. Now, I remember when the, the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened last Wednesday, uh, I was just looking on Twitter, uh, you know, and I think it's one of those interesting new tools which has become quite influential nowadays, although there, of course there's lots and lots of spoof accounts on there, all who seem to follow each other, but one of the tweets on Wednesday really struck me, Kevin, which was, you know, hundreds of thousands of Muslims have been killed over the last 10 years in many countries, uh, and yet 12 people are dead today, and there's no comparison with the coverage. And, you know, this is the point, isn't it, is that one life seems to be worth less or more than another if it's in Paris. You know, obviously, from a news point of view, it's not the norm in Paris. But what's happened is many parts of the world now, it has become the norm that people are dying every day. Uh, really, essentially, for uh, with Western interests involved, Western people funding, arming various kind of uh, rebel groups like you know the massive amount of funding and arms that have gone into the Syrian rebels, this kind of thing. So it's okay because it's not news; it's normal in many parts of the world. I mean, like Libya, for example, we just had peace talks over the UN peace talks over the last few days about Libya. Libya is chaos now; it's been completely taken apart, and the two main reasons. Um, from certainly from the British public's point of view that we were given uh, to do with why Colonel Gaddafi was a, a dangerous nutcase and that something had to be done about him. One was the Lockerbie bombing, which it transpires through Alan Frankovich's film, uh, the Maltese double cross. If you see that, you'll realise that it was nothing whatsoever to do with Libya. And also most of the uh, families of the survivors of the Lockerbie bomb will say the same, nothing to do with Libya. And uh, it was, it, Megrahi was clearly fitted up and in fact, when it looked like evidence might come out that he was fitted up, he was released from Scotland and uh, went back to Libya to die. Um, so that was number one reason was completely phony from top to bottom. The, the second reason was the killing of PC Yvonne Fletcher in London outside the Libyan embassy, uh, supposedly shot from, uh, from the Libyan embassy. Well, another time, a dispatches documentary, two-part dispatches documentary, Death in St. James, absolutely proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was impossible for her to have been shot from the Libyan embassy. It was actually an office, um, a different part of the square, which had been rented by the security services, uh, which overlooked her because she was shot uh, and killed with a bullet that actually entered her body quite high up her torso and went through it from above. So it couldn't possibly have been the Libyans that killed her. So the, both the reasons that were given in Britain for that were bogus. The whole entire takeover of Libya is all a war crime in my view uh, and certainly the UN um, agreement 
the no-fly zone was just not kept to by the Brits at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, so these are the sorts of situations we've created, which is bound to have a backlash. But then, you know, the, it looks to me as if this backlash in, in France has, has, has some elements of uh, timing and control. Uh, we know that uh, if these guys were who they, we're told they are, we've only got the anonymous police spokespeople's word for it, uh, that um, that they almost were almost certainly trained by our special forces with our taxpayers' money, uh, so uh, maybe that was a, a silly thing to do, uh, and it's also against the backdrop of what, which is uh, a really important, I think, Kevin. In all of this, is the global economy grinding to a halt. I mean, we've had uh, over the last few weeks, uh, we've had all the um, the slide in oil prices is becoming quite obvious that that doesn't seem to be ending any time and it looks possibly terminal. Uh, one thing always to watch is the Baltic Dry Index and how much it's costing uh, to hire ships to cart stuff around the world when real demand is going down, never mind what the figures say. And also, of course, the price of copper and other metals uh, going down. Copper is a really important indicator to keep an eye on. It's going down. It's, so what's happening is the casino economy seems to be doing okay because it's been pumped with quantitative easing. But the real world economy is hitting the buffers. Uh, and, of course, this is a big disaster. And the problem, from my point of view, is looking at that, you do wonder, don't you, whether the powers that be know all this stuff and they will be wanting to make a killing out of a crash. And the best way to start a crash might well be to have... Uh, war, <laughs> more war, uh, and it, it's all getting a little bit apocalyptic, particularly with this uh, ramping up tension with the Russians. Uh, so you know you've got prophecy about this. You know the apocalyptic stuff. I always, you know, I think it's a good idea to look at. You know, sometimes the Book of Revelation talks about the red horse, which indicates war, and the black horse, which indicates crash. You know, basically economic disaster and uh, this kind of thing. I think you know we need to be taking these kinds of prophecies on board. I mean, I'm not a prophet myself, you know, obviously, but I'm looking at some of this prophecy and thinking, well, maybe this kind of thing is is coming to pass. Have you looked at the work of Imran Hussein, the Islamic eschatologist, who's done a lot of work well, on this? Wouldn't it be interesting to contrast the two, Islamic and Christian eschatology? What, what do you make of that? Well, well they're very close. Uh, you know, I guess the, the key difference is that because he's relying primarily on Islamic sources, above all Quran, but also some, some hadith, uh, Imran Hussein has the view that uh, Islam will, in the last days, kind of be linked to the good Christians, and the good Christians will be mostly the Eastern Christians. And, you know, Western Christianity, he believes, has been largely hijacked by the New World Order Zionists, who he equates with Dajjal or the Antichrist. So, in, in his view, Zionism, which aims to uh, bloodily take over and commit genocide in the Holy Land, in order to ultimately tear down the Islamic world's greatest and oldest architectural monument, the Masjid al-Aqsa, or Dome on the Rock, and rebuild the, supposedly the Solomon's Temple, uh, and then rule uh, greater Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates under a new Messiah. That would be, the Jews would say this is the real Messiah, the guy who's going to be the world dictator ruling the world from Jerusalem in this per period. That guy, according to Imran Hussein, will be the Antichrist because Jesus was the true Messiah. And so when somebody comes along now and says they're the dictator running the world from Jerusalem, uh, that person is going to be a false messiah, a.k.a. the Antichrist or Dajjal. And, and this is pretty close to what you might get from Christian prophecy as well. Yeah, fascinating stuff, isn't it? I mean, you know, interesting times we're living in when this kind of thing is being discussed. And, you know, and obviously it's all playing out in the Middle East. I, I think, though, I think uh, I'd have to disagree about, uh, you know, Western Christianity completely because uh, I think, yes, whilst the, a lot of the leadership's positions in many of the churches uh, in the West are taken over by, uh, you know, well, secret societies, all sorts. I mean, obviously, you know, Freemasonry has been very much targeting religion and politics for hundreds of years, you know, and, and uh, in doing its best to infiltrate uh, pliable people into top positions in these churches. But I think mean, ordinary people who are part of these congregations, I mean, for one thing, for example, one of the key things is this whole idea of crusades. You know, it, it, so we say 20 years ago, many churches talked about, oh, we're going to have a crusade and raise some money, or we're going to have a crusade. And nowadays, it's just not, you know, everybody knows mm -hmm. the crusades are absolutely out of order. And, and the idea... Well, of George Bush didn't get that memo. 
No, he didn't. He certainly did. Nor did Tony Blair, I don't think. But, uh, you know, so there is a, a very much an awareness amongst the congregations. It's the leadership, you know, as usual. You know, they think that they're actually in charge. No, they're, they're guiding people and guiding them, some of them off the cliff, obviously. But, you know, they, they, these leadership positions are actually only, you know, uh, temporary. And, and they give them an illusion in fact, sometimes they believe their own propaganda, Kevin, don't they? You know, I think they think that they really are in charge. You know? I think they almost have to. You know, I, I just can't see how any of these people could remember everything. If you know, it's it's so much easier to just tell the truth. You don't have to remember so much. Of course, and, of course it is. Yeah. So they have I mean, to. Listen, they have the fact to believe it. Here is 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 we've got uh, the CIA torture report, which was amazing before Christmas. You know, the the French uh, Marine Le Pen uh, nationalist leader. Um, talked about again reviving this idea of the French leaving NATO as a result of, the, of that, saying that we want nothing to do with this. This is just going to make things difficult for France. Uh, and that discussion was being had with the French, who uh, you know, there was I think it was 31 times, wasn't it? They tried to assassinate somebody, tried to assassinate Charles de Gaulle, and eventually he left NATO in 1966. And the assassination attempts kind of slowed down a bit. But you know, this this is the problem with France: is they've always been actually quite a democratic country uh, compared to other places in Europe and they've shown fierce independence quite socialist in the best possible sense that is to say we'll look you know not not a kind of command economy but let's have some of the basic things in life like things like water you know uh, housing this kind of stuff organized by the state so we don't have squalor uh, and um, they've been really good on that on that side of the French so they see themselves as you know, wanting to be independent uh, from the US influence and de Gaulle was kept Britain out of the U- e- e- EEC as it was in the 1970s the European Economic Community because he saw uh, Britain as quite rightly as a, as a cat's paw for the US just you know sort of uh, may as well have the Americans running things and the French almost more than anyone else were aware of what had happened with Operation Paperclip with many of the Nazis that had occupied their country during World War II uh, making their way over to the US and being welcomed with open arms, many being given new identities, many being given jobs, uh, almost all actually being given pensions over there in the US. And we had that story, didn't we, as well, before Christmas of the thousand ex-Nazis getting uh, you know, US state aid and through the Secret Services over there. Right. And that uh, Nazi uh, infiltration after World War II seem to be linked with Operation Gladio. Uh, some of those people were experts in various kinds of provocations and counterinsurgencies, and you know they'd been involved in, in you know, murdering people on the Eastern Front, all sorts of things. So let, let's talk a little bit more about Gladio, because that's such an important topic. Uh, tell us about how Operation Gladio developed and how it relates to what's going on now with these things like Charlie Hebdo and then the... Uh, what big scandal that's broken out in Brussels. Well, well, first of all, with Operation Gladio, hats off to two people. One is Danny Eleganza, who's the Swiss academic, uh, the author of NATO's Secret Armies, which was really the first really good definitive um, readable academic uh, treatise on the whole Gladio affair and you know, pulling together a lot of the evidence, um, newspaper articles, Hugh O'Shaughnessy and various other journalists writing about it, as well as the three parliamentary inquiries in Italy, uh, Switzerland and Belgium into the Operation Gladio. did an amazing job with that, Daniela, and he's still, I mean, um, I would be really interested to hear what he's got to say about <laughs> about the Charlie Hebdo business. But, but uh, that aside, also, of course, Alan Frankovich, your very own uh, L.A. film school, I think he went to, um, and uh, I think he was uh, the son of a Peruvian industrialist, uh, was born in Peru, uh, but but uh, cut his teeth making films in the US and then came over to Britain and Europe and made the three-part BBC Time Watch film on Operation Gladio uh, for 1992-1993, was broadcast here on British television. And I don't know if anybody uh, quite realised what they were watching at the time. It was gobsmacking stuff. You know, NATO is blowing people up all around Europe. All the terrorists we've seen for the last 20, 30 years in Europe, that is to say the Bader meinhof gang, uh, Axion Direct in Belgium, um, uh, the Red Brigades in Italy were actually being run by a kind of parallel government, secret government, um, which was this fascist uh, Operation Gladio stay behind force run out of um, really, I suppose, two main headquarters other than MI6 and CIA who were the main 
agencies behind it. Uh, one was uh, Shape Headquarters, um, you know, in uh, in NATO and NATO intelligence, and also this enigmatic Club of the Bern, they called the Club of Bern, which was made up of retired intelligence officers uh, as well as uh, serving intelligence officers and um, which we say far right leaning ones and also uh, a smattering of kind of mercenary private military uh, meeting in Switzerland together and and that was um, I suppose probably one of the most obvious examples of how the Nazi influence carried on through Europe now Belgium was one of the major targets of Gladio uh, and that was during the time where the Belgian Parliament was um, basically preparing to kick out American cruise missiles, seeing itself quite obviously as a, a target for Russian hydrogen bombs, um, should there be any kind of uh, uh, conflict. And the Belgians had decided there's absolutely no point in having and no reason to have any US cruise missiles uh, in Belgium because it just makes us a target and why would we want to be a target there's no strategic reason to do this we've got no quarrel with the Russians this kind of thing and just as they were starting to build up to a vote to um, tell the, the US uh, uh, to remove their uh, nuclear weapons from Belgium uh, so they had these supermarket massacres now it now turns out through the, the uh, uh, and of course of course you know the supermarket um, uh, siege we saw just last week the part uh, the Charlie Hebdo supermarket right, right. more supermarket uh, massacres <laughs> the more one. things change the more they stay the same well uh, and also yeah, the characteristic of Gladio was this kind of uh, in your face public places that is to say um, bank in the, in the banks that is where loads of people actually using the bank were killed um, public transport belonging to railway station um, where I think 87 people were killed in the third oh, class yeah, yeah. Wait, waiting room and uh, and the supermarket massacres, it was, I think, just under 30 um, Belgians were killed by what it now looks like were U.S. Marines who'd parachuted in to Belgium. Uh, uh, Vilsalm police station, which was a bit out of the way. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it was in Belgium, but it was it was a sort of countryside place. They had a, a weapons store there and the Marines broke into the police station stole these weapons and then killed one or two policemen and a Belgian policeman who tried to apprehend them and used these weapons for these supermarket massacres um, and then left them in a left wing squad. So, you know, the idea really to plant the evidence on the left to make it look as if the left had been, you know, sort of doing all this stuff. And then par I don't know, they don't parachute out, do they? I'm not sure quite how they got out again. But this kind of attack has, has almost been f deliberately forgotten. And this is why I think we need to really be patting Galliana Ganser and Alan Frankovich very firmly on the back and saying, well, without you guys, it probably would have been forgotten, Kevin. Right. And, and this leads us to the topic of this type of terrorism going on today, not only in, possibly in Europe, uh, but also in countries like Pakistan uh, and Syria and Iraq. It seems that the Sunni versus Shia split was partly created by this kind of false flag terrorism in which attacks such as the uh, destruction of the Golden Dome, uh, Samara, the uh, British soldiers who were actually arrested by Iraqi authorities trying to blow up mosques and markets in Basra, and, and they were caught, they were dressed as Arabs. Uh, in several of these cases, the, the uh, Raymond Davis case in Pakistan, where a CIA agent named Raymond Davis was arrested uh, perpetrating false flag terrorism, in all of these cases it seems that they're doing very much what they did in Belgium, parachuting in Marines to, to murder people in the supermarket. Uh, they're doing the same type of thing, parachuting in special forces people to murder people in mosques and markets in places like Pakistan and Iraq as well. Well, it does go to show just how totally out of control these people are. Uh, I mean, one of the um, uh, uh, reactions here in Britain to the, the Paris attacks has been really one of the most appalling bits of political opportunities I've ever seen, which is Prime Minister David Cameron again calling for this thing called the Snoopers Charter, uh, which even his bedfellows in the coalition, the Liberal Democrats, uh, refused to support, so it's not, uh, hopefully never going to happen unless maybe the Labour Party goes for it, which is not entirely impossible because their leadership is pretty inept. But, but um, you know, the incredible thing about the Snoopers Charter is what they're trying to do with that is to get the right to see everybody's 
uh, communications, emails, so that there's nothing, basically would make it effectively uh, an offence to be doing anything, any kind of communication which was in any way encrypted so that the security services couldn't read it. I mean, that, I mean, what we're talking about here is the sort of thing that the Gestapo would have had wet dreams about, really amazingly powerful uh, form of totalitarian system of snooping on everybody. But, you know, the thing that bothers me about it is that actually all they seem to be doing with this legislation, if you believe Edward Snowden, is simply bringing the criminal activities of the securocrats, of GCHQ, of the NSA and the other agencies around the Western world that you do signals intelligence, is bringing what they're up to within the law. Uh, because at the moment what they're doing is criminal. It's going through people's uh, private communications without a warrant. It's uh, snooping on the confidential uh, discussions between clients and their lawyers, including uh, clients and their lawyers that may be suing uh, the intelligence services or the security services or the government. So they're using this as a, uh, really as a weapon against us. So the idea is that, that much of our military money, might and effort is not going on defending the country against foreigners. It's going on a, a, an active attack against civil society domestically. Uh, and so that's why what Cameron's doing is so appalling, is that he's just trying to change the law so that uh, people who are now committing criminal offences within our security state uh, don't have to go to jail. Or you know, it is it is just appalling to see that kind of um, reaction to what happened in in Paris, rather than some kind of real effort to stop the root of the problem, which is this incredible uh, mission abroad. We seem to have this kind of obsession with military expeditionism uh, a bit like a bit medieval really it's like you know we've got to plunder every every spring where are we going to plunder next spring and bring back the booty mm -hmm. uh, you know i've talked to soldiers for example who just simply you know make it they say well we're actually on the front line it's obvious what we're up to we're just stealing for the tribe mm -hmm. right yeah there's a guy here in wisconsin who apparently has millions of dollars worth of art and artifacts plundered from museums in iraq in his house I haven't seen them, but that's the rumor from somebody who says he has, uh, indeed, plundering for the tribe. Well, speaking of the connections between the current situation and the Crusades, when the Crusaders were doing a lot of plundering for the tribe, they were even massacring Jews and stealing their money on the way to the Holy Land. And when they got there, they massacred everybody. Uh, today, we, we have, uh, some say, a survival of some of these organizations, like the Knights Templar, which was a crusading organization. You mentioned in your email that the uh, somebody in the journalistic community called the Paris attack the most deadly in Western Europe since 7-7 when 52 died, but he forgot about what you called the Freemason Zionist Knights Templar, Anders Breivik's <laughs> July 2011 uh, Utoya attacks, which killed 77 young people. That is the entire future of the uh, the youth wing of the Labor Party up there. Now, could you elaborate a little bit about the Freemason Zionist Knights Templar aspect of Breivik? Because I've heard this from my intelligence contacts through Veterans Today as well, that they say that this thing was covered up. Well, first off, the police didn't try to stop it. They had boats. They could have easily gotten to that island and stopped it, and they intentionally didn't. And I'm told that that's because Freemasonic networks have infiltrated the police in Norway and essentially ordered them to stand down while the professionals did the killing. What what kind of Freemasonic Zionist Knights Templar <laughs> networks are we talking about? Because you know that's uh, a lot of people who don't know anything about this would say, "Wow, this sounds pretty crazy." Well, uh, you listen, there's a lot of questions to answer in one there, but uh, let, look, let's start with the actual Breivik attacks, um, where, where the police helicopter was not available. Uh, in fact, whoever was uh, in charge of the police reaction to it, and I think there were several people on different shifts that were, they repeatedly asked for the helicopter and they couldn't have that, the uh, anti-terror helicopter, the police helicopter in Oslo. I mean, it's not the biggest city. It's not like one of these big British or uh, US cities, Oslo. Uh, and they were told, no, it, it wasn't available. It wasn't available. And then the only time it was used on the day of the uh, Breivik attacks was uh, late that evening uh, to go and hover over an altercation outside a nightclub. Uh, in, in Oslo, you know, so this was a serious problem is that the police had one of their main tools to use against Breivik um, completely, uh, they were paralysed from using it. 
But, I mean, look, the Knights Templar side of things, yes, Crusades, all that sort of stuff. I mean, you go back to the medieval times, um, you know, the, the, the Knights Templar clearly were one of the most pernicious cults ever, worshipping ebony skulls and saying that they were some kind of Christian knighthood, uh, being the first multinational corporation in the world, uh, first international bankers. They really were uh, the cult of all cults uh, at the, uh, in the medieval times, including, of course, for anyone that's done their history on this, you'll know that they actually went and sacked Constantinople, which was the sort of headquarters of Christianity at the time, because they had a bit of a falling out with the people that ran Constantinople, so they uh, attacked it and, you know, basically <laughs> uh, murdered hundreds of people, etc. So these guys weren't really practicing Christianity, I think, you know, yeah, that's pretty clear, uh, in all sorts of ways. And then we, we run all the way forward to the French king, Philip the Fair, in 1307, ordered the arrest of the Knights Templar, and uh, and on the 13th, Friday the 13th of October, which is where we get this whole Friday the 13th thing from. And, and that's interesting. That, that suggests that the, the Knights Templar had enough power to make all of us mourn a, a bad day for them. Well, I don't... Yes, I think the thing is, of course, the Friday the 13th is a good thing. What the French king did was he was uh, basically trying to uh, put a stop to this cult. But, of course, it was a very powerful cult. It had spies in his court. And most of the wealth of the Templars that was in France was smuggled out before it happened, um, and the Grand Master Jacques de Molay was uh, burnt at the stake. And many people say, oh, it's only torture that they managed to get these confessions. Well, actually, there are at least two Knights Templar who were whistleblowers, who weren't tortured, who came to uh, the French court and explained. I think one was Geoffrey de Bizol. Um, I can't remember the name of the other chap, but, uh, I mean, if we go all that way back in time, whistleblowers still... Uh, are very, very important. And back then, they were listened to by the French king because he was having a little bit of d difficult relations with the Templars because they were guarding his um, crown jewels uh, and his treasures. And he found sometimes he wasn't allowed access to them. He's like, hang on a minute, who do you think you guys are? So there was a bit of friction there, which is why he was prepared to get them in the, the Templars investigated. But anyway, fast forward uh, several hundred years to the French Revolution and many... Um, Observers would say that, uh, and, and researchers and historians would say that um, the massive revenge that there was uh, against France uh, was actually connected with this attack on the Templars hundreds of years before through the French Revolution and the reign of terror and the merciless destruction of the aristocracy through uh, what was mostly organised by um, the, at least uh, it seems, through the Grand Orient. Uh, Masonic lodges in France that were behind uh, most of the events that ran up to and included the most bloody parts of the French Revolution. So, you know, you, 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 we haven't even really talked about Breivik, but there's a whole history here connected with France and the uh, Philip the Fair's, uh, well, I would say, is a, quite a brave attempt to try and deal with this cult that was controlling so much money in in um, France at the time uh, and and the vengeance that was was wreaked on the country hundreds of years afterwards. But but, but look, Breivik was in London uh, in the 1990s, I think, or maybe early 2000s, uh, at a founding meeting, apparently, of something called the Knights Templar, um, which was uh, where also uh, people who were involved in the English Defence League, this far-right group um, here in Britain, were also there, racist group, uh, and other people from other parts of Europe, um, very, very much an anti-Islamic group, very much a pro-Zionist group. And the other thing with Breivik, of course, is that the um, young people were preparing a uh, anti-Israel campaign over at, at Utoya Island uh, to roll out across Norway, basically a boycott, divestment, um, sanctions campaign, talking about the way that the Israeli state has been, um, you know, it, it, it attacking the Palestinians. And look, many people don't talk about Israel as a crusader state, but I certainly would say this is a crusader state, a modern crusader state. And when Bush talked about, you know, we're going to have a crusade, I don't think he really knew his history, but he was absolutely right about the idea of uh, Western power being projected, undemocratic power being projected into the Middle East once more. Indeed. Well, I have a bumper sticker that reads, End the Crusades, Give Palestine Back. Uh, don't know when that's but, going to happen. I mean, the obvious thing about all this, which never gets the commentary on the mainstream press, Kevin, is uh, what about the Palestinians' right of return in a few years' time? Uh, you know, because we've got the right, right of return 
of the Jewish people to uh, to Israel and Palestine, which you know is arguable. But but I mean, if they're going to be removing um, Palestinian indigenous people who are there, at some point in the future, they're going to demand a right to return as well. So it's really a, very much a kind of copy of what happened in Northern Ireland. I think, you know, with the, 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 the awful situation where loads of people were shipped over from Scotland and England, uh, the Protestants, into Northern Ireland and put in charge of vast areas of land and industries and things like that. And the indigenous population was kind of moved over to the badlands. Uh, many of them, of course, starved through the famine mm-hmm. uh, and put on ships and sent over to the US to do, <laughs> to do colonising. But obviously many died in the famine. Uh, as well, millions and millions died, and I looked at that whole business of the people being chased away from North Africa, from uh, from Syria particularly, and and Turkey, where many of these refugees have gone uh, to try and get to Italy, and I see it as an almost a sort of repeat of this uh, this refugee crisis that we had in the uh, 1870s and 1880s, where there were millions of people got kind of kicked off Ireland and Scotland and got put on ships and sent over to America. We've got the same kind of thing going on now in the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. Very interesting comparison. Well, you know, what you mentioned about the Scots people being sent over to Northern Ireland and becoming settler colonialists is a good example of that process of settler colonialism that has happened in, in several places. In places in the Western Hemisphere, of course, uh, it worked because the indigenous people weren't resistant to diseases and the indigenous uh, plant and animal life was not as strong as the Eurasian plant and animal life. So we had a wholesale kind of ecological imperialist genocide over here where the European people and the European flora and fauna largely took over North America and as well as the temperate parts of South America, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. These are the fully uh, ecologically imperialist colonized places, according to Alfred Crosby, the author of Ecological Imperialism. But when they try to do settler colonies in places where the people and the flora and fauna are resistant to diseases and already Eurasian and and tough, (laughs) then it doesn't work, which is why in Algeria, the French couldn't turn Algeria into just another part of the hexagon, the French state. South Africa, the Afrikaners couldn't completely eradicate the indigenous people and take it over as a white Afrikaner state. And likewise, in Palestine, of course, the uh, invading uh, Europeans are not going to be able to eradicate the Middle Eastern people and take their place. So these, these settler colonial experiments generally don't work. And the last one that's operating big time now is over in occupied Palestine, so it's kind of about living on borrowed time, and I think that explains partly the desperation of these forces that are trying to keep it going and keep it expanding. And those forces, as you suggest, Tony, I think they involve uh, secret societies as well as sort of you know, ethnic supremacist Jews, like post-religious heretical Jews who are worshipping the flag of the state of Israel instead of God. Uh, there are certainly are enough of them around. And then there are a lot of Christian Zionists who have been brainwashed by the Schofield Bible. But you're suggesting that there are these secret societies that may actually be lurking behind the scenes and orchestrating this new crusade. Well, I mean, certainly uh, there's the, you know, the evidence. I mean, my, my evidence uh, I've dug out about the Bilderberg is quite clearly a very, very important and, and totally taboo center of power. Most of the money in the Western world is controlled by these people. Um, and you know most young, many many young people now are aware of it, thank God. But there's still the mainstream media will not deal with it. You know th- these these types, as many Freemasons uh, involved in the creation of that, Joseph Ratzinger, uh, the uh, the Polish uh, Freemason, he was one of the key people involved in organising that. He'd been the MI6 uh, agent and also aide to General Sikorsky um, during the Polish leader during the um, Second World War who mysteriously didn't travel with Sikorsky on the day that he died uh, in an um, uh, aircraft in Gibraltar. Um, and Sikorsky, of course, was carrying the hopes of, uh, of Poland and also was rather annoyed that Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill had sat down at Yalta and decided, well, actually, Poland is going over to the Soviet bloc. You know, Sikorsky didn't like that and he was making a bit of trouble. And um, so uh, Rettinger went on after the the war to be the main person actually organising the first Bilderberg conference in um, in 1954 in the Bilderberg Hotel, which is where the conferences get their name from, in Oosterbeek, just on the outskirts of Arnhem. 
in Holland. Um, also, Andrew Palmer is another Freemason involved in key place with, with the Bilderbergs. He is the organiser of the uh, last but one Bilderberg meeting to take place in Britain, which was in Turnbury in 1998. Andrew Palmer is also the uh, personal assistant to the Duke of Kent, the Cousins Queen, and also the Grand Master of World Freemasonry. So I think you'd have to be a bit naive to think that there wasn't some sort of uh, Masonic connection here. Uh, I mean, I'm not in, in any way condemning Freemasons as indivi individuals, but you know, when they swear those Masonic oaths, they better remember that they can't be a Christian and a Mason, because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, never swear an oath. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else comes from the devil. I mean, that's pretty clear. Well, that's one of the problems with secret societies is, is the whole idea of having a secret society in the first place seems a bit dubious. Why do you need to keep secrets? And then if your secret society like Freemasonry is about helping each other advance in wealth and power, I mean, what's well, the no, difference? Kevin, it's like organized sorry, crime. Kevin, can I just interrupt you there? Because sure. I think... In, your, in the early days of Freemasonry, in the 1700s and 1800s, possibly to a lesser extent, but, you know, the, the, the uh, climate was very different. It was very intolerant. Society was very intolerant. There were very strict religious rules that everyone had to obey. And the, the Masons really were, I mean, I don't know if you or I might have found ourselves uh, in Masonic circles in those days where you did feel that you could free, speak freely. Right. Uh, and they did provide a, 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 an important, I think, um, sort of speakeasy environment. But, uh, you know, not all Masons were happy with the way that the organization was progressing. I mean, particularly John Robeson in the 19, uh, in, sorry, in the 1790s, uh, he could see that uh, Freemasonry was becoming a kind of totalitarian organisation from the top down, um, and he wrote that the classic uh, proofs of a conspiracy. And he obviously set aside quite a large time of his uh, proportion of his life to make sure that this stuff was written down for us. You know, this is back in the late 1700s where he he, he really documents the. Uh, takeover of Freemasonry at the time, um, the terrible lamenting of this organisation that he would felt so uh, important uh, a part of his life. I mean, he was himself a genius, I think it's fair to say. He was a close friend of James Watt, who invented the steam engine, and he was, uh, he was the secretary of the Royal Society in Edinburgh um, and a, a great inventor in his own right. But he could see that this society was being dragged down, really taken over to the dark side, and he wanted to make sure that it was indelibly uh, there for the people like us today to understand you know what this kind of uh, cult had become because I mean it was you know it was I think it, you know it kind of inert secret society in those days and it was actually doing quite a lot of good but nowadays uh, I mean certainly my experience talking to Freemasons is that uh, the dark side is really taking over you know lodge by lodge um, bit by bit uh, even the you know the, the 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 Masonic lodges that have been actually quite positive and doing good stuff. Uh, one by one uh, are falling to the dark side. And, and that's what bothers me about all of this stuff to do with the, you know, the, the conflict we've been talking about in, 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 in Paris, um, all the stuff in the Middle East, and also the looming financial crash behind the scenes. Uh, and all of this uh, seems to me pretty obvious at some point in the future. I mean, we're, we're, we're on a teetering on the brink of the cliff when it comes to uh, the financial system uh, because the real economy is becoming strangled, the casino economy is bloated uh, and at any point it can have a reset and that is what we call a crash um, back in 2008 that was averted by the public bailout here in Britain something like £750 billion pounds poured into the coffers of the banks which they've simply used to lobby Didn't some of that come power. from the Federal Reserve here in the US? Sorry? Uh, didn't some of that come from the Federal Reserve in the U.S., which did the QE and distributed huge piles of money all over the world? Well, they have, certainly the QE. What I'm talking about is the actual 2008 bailout, but since then, the bailout hasn't really uh, you know, brought the economy back to life, so the, the QE has had to be being shoveled into the casino economy to try and keep share prices going. But you know, the, the, the two economies, the casino world and the real world, are uh, diverging fast. And at some point in the future... Uh, not too distant future, those two are going to have to come back together again, and that will be a crash. That will mean that the uh, share prices will reset to their real levels rather than the bloated, inflated levels, 
uh, and many many savers will lose many millions. And of course, but people like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers uh, have already um, are already ready for this. You know, they've created a, uh, their own little company to buy up all these sort of distressed assets and make a fortune out of it when we do get the reset. They'll undoubtedly be buying put options uh, right before the crash happens, just like somebody was buying put options on United, American, and Morgan Stanley right before 9-11. Well, well, Tony, getting back to the secret society issue, uh, Dan Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol, describes absolute Freemasonic power in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is just one big Freemasonic symbol in terms of its layout and architecture. And interestingly, this novel posits a takeover of Freemasonry by a, a Crowley-following Satanist. And he, in the, in the novel, he's a lone nut. So this incredible Superman villain figure is this lone nut Aleister Crowley-following Satanist who is, has risen to the top of Freemasonry and is now running amok slaughtering people. And I wondered if that might be sort of a Romana Clay talking about the dark side of Freemasonry taking over. And you certainly are seeing that in the U.K. with this pedophilia scandal, supposedly as many as, what was it, uh, 50,000 or something kids, uh, tens of thousands of children molested by top British leaders, and it seems that the secret societies may have a hand in this. Uh, Do you think that the Charlie Hebdo affair may be partly designed to divert attention from this scandal at the highest levels of power in the U.K.? Well, I don't think I don't think there's necessarily a connection between those two. I think Charlie Hebdo is very much uh, aimed at the, the French political elite and uh, the public and decision makers in France uh, over this kind of wobble over whether to join the NATO. But I mean, you know, certainly in Britain, this whole thing is being kicked out into the long grass because the scores of public figures who uh, is quite clear are now involved in this um, paedophile scandal. Uh, many of them are uh, the Tory, ruling Tory party. And so the last thing that the Tories want in the run-up to May's uh, general election this year is this any of this coming out. So the whole thing is being you know, basically kicked out into the long grass again and again and again. And um, what's happened is there's something called the People's Tribunal been set up, which is uh, really run by survivors and some of the uh, lawyers, barristers that they trust um, so that seems to me to be the only way that th- th- this is going to come out is through that. But I mean, I've heard anecdotally that there's all sorts of kind of disruption of that being going on with possibly uh, agents planted in amongst the survivors who are then attacking other survivors, this kind of thing. I mean, it's difficult to know to what extent this is just uh, simply uh, people, um, you know, uh, having personal issues with others. But it does seem as if that's being actively destabilized. Uh, as well. So, you know, we've got that problem going on in Britain, but it's interesting how that's bubbled up over sort of 20, 30 years on and off. Uh, and it seems pretty clear that um, many of our top politicians over that time have been being blackmailed by these gangs. Uh, and that seems to be the main motive behind it is simply political blackmail. Um, but yeah, getting getting back to the sort of uh, the jihadi and the, um, well, I don't really like calling them jihadis, but that's the easiest way, I suppose, if they really are, uh, is is looking at, at, you know, some of the stuff to do with the 7-7 London bombings. You mentioned the Simon Israel report on Channel 4 News, which I pointed out. Simon Israel saying that uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks were the biggest in Western Europe since the 7-7 London bombings, and then missing out the the Breivik attacks, where 77 were killed, actually more people than were killed in both the London bombings and the the, uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks put together. Uh, So he's really totally misleading the public there. uh, uh, And uh, absolutely appalling to think that that sort of mad, massive inaccuracy can take place on national TV uh, without a big hoo-ha about it, saying, who is this guy? Get him off the screen. I mean, Hmm. it just seems that he's... And he's even named uh, Simon Israel, of all people, to to make that mistake. Yeah, Yeah, he's the security (laughs) correspondent for ITN's Channel 4 News, and uh, I just could not believe my ears when I saw him saying that, uh, because he obviously, he would would probably use the excuse, oh, well, I said Western Europe. Hang on a minute. You look at almost any map of Western Europe, that includes Norway and Sweden, actually it includes Scandinavia. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the sort of sneaky thing you can, that gives you an indication that there is something to hide. Uh, quite mm. clearly there is Indeed. With, with, these, with these Paris attacks. Indeed. Okay, well, we're just about at the end of the show. Can you tell us a little bit of, uh, more about what you do? You mentioned that you have worked for the BBC 
And, you know, I, I actually got taken in by a hoax when supposedly they're blaming Anonymous for setting up a BBC parallel website and putting up a very authentic-looking fake BBC page reporting on the false flag evidence around the Charlie Hebdo shootings. And it looked so real that, you know, I sent out an email saying, wow, check this out, BBC story. And, of course, then it was taken down and they blamed it on Anonymous. Um, but could you, having worked for the BBC, can you ever conceive of the BBC actually reporting the kind of stuff that you and I are talking about right now? Well, hang on, Kevin, because the BBC transmitted um, the Time Watch, three Time Watch programs all about Operation Gladio. Uh, I think it's pretty clear around about mid uh, early 90s uh, when the, I mean, we had a what I would consider probably the best um, documentary workforce in the world for television in Britain up until about 1993, 1994. And uh, it had been Yorkshire Television's uh, Tim Tate, a producer who actually lives not far from me here in southern England. Uh, and he put together this documentary for Discovery Channel uh, called Conspiracy of Silence. And I don't know if you've ever come across that film. And that's about the Franklin cover-up, right? That's right. And also the connections, with, of course, with Washington, D.C. D. Wait, wait, that, that was made by Boys. BBC? Boys Town. No, it wasn't. No, no, no. That's that was made by Yorkshire TV okay. um, for the Discovery Channel. That's part of the ITV network. But and and then it was bought up at the last minute before broadcast well, and supposedly he was destroyed. Paid, he was paid uh, half a million dollars for that program, but it was never transmitted. Uh, and that pretty much was the moment where Western. Um, I say that moment, but around about that time, at the same sort of time that the Frankovich documentary was being transmitted that somebody somewhere decided we're not going to have any more real investigative documentaries uh, in the Western world, you know, and I say, well, I say, I suppose, Britain and the United States, this special relationship, so-called special relationship. But, uh, you know, isn't it weird how Britain has created these two poison children, America? I mean, you know, obviously, I don't think Americans are poisonous, but we've created this state. And also with Israel too, Kevin, what do you make of that? Britain, over the years, has created two of the most disastrous uh, totalitarian countries that the world has ever seen you know okay so nazi germany is in the past but right now these two countries seem to be some of the worst that's right well of course if you were trying to defend britain you could say that well it's all the fault of those crazy american colonists who rebelled against us or you could say oh it's all the fault of those crazy zionist terrorists who rebelled against us and blew us up in the hotel bombing and so on but yeah i, I think that that there's a lot of british complicity in all of this stuff and, you know, for instance, the story goes that the Rothschilds approached the British leaders during World War I and said, we can help you win. Don't call off the war like you were planning to and, you know, call it even and go back to the status quo ante. Instead, take our money and we will help you win the war. We'll bring America in on your side. All you have to do is give us Palestine. And the British leaders supposedly acquiesced to that, which led to the Balfour Declaration. And uh, the rest is history. Well, we're not really sure, but one thing's for sure is I think it's it's beholden on us, people living in this part of the world, to try and do something about this, if, even if it's only just to try and help raise awareness uh, about this kind of Gladio-style operation. And it does show that uh, our ruling elite, uh, our criminal elite, uh, have really got to the stage where they're so desperate as to um, be killing their own people. It's, it's actually a form of uh, mental illness writ large, isn't it? Self-harming. Indeed. Well, we're living in a, a crazy world, and the people leading it seem to be the craziest of all. That's some, John Lennon said something along those lines, and it's certainly still apropos. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tony Gosling. I appreciate your terrific work. And once again, remind our listeners that of your PEPIS, uh, is it the website or the newsletter, the organization, P-E-P-I-S? Oh, no, you, just, you just have to do a, use your favorite search in, engine and find uh, the Power Elite Public Information Service. I've got a couple of websites too, which is the, one of them is Bilderberg.org, which is looking into the origins and, and the uh, influence of the Bilderberg conferences. Yeah, and um, more uh, sort of week to week, it's um, thisweek.org.uk, uh, which is where you'll find our weekly politics program broadcast uh, from Bristol here, which of course is the city that so-called discovered America and started a lot of this trouble. Okay. Well, as as part of the trouble that's been started, uh, I appreciate your great work in trying to expose the truth and turn things towards a better path. Thank you so much, Tony Gosling. Keep up the great work. And thank you, Kevin.